in service. We are so glad that you're here with us. We're in the middle of our Daring Faith series, our Same Page Initiative, and uh, today I'm going to be talking about daring to wait. You know, one of the things that I'm not very good at is being patient, a little impatient. I remember when I was in grade 12, I had this really cool 1983 Toyota Supra, and uh, it was black, it was awesome, and I remember right around my graduation, I was driving my Supra, and it started to rain, I went to put on my windshield wipers, and they didn't work, and I was so angry, because I had a lot of things to do that day, I was prepping for graduation, there were just things to do, I was wanting to hang with my friends and do stuff, and, and all of a sudden, my, my wipers didn't work, and I was basically like Jim Carrey, you know, I rolled down my window and I'm, I'm trying to drive and I, I get to the shop where my dad works. My dad's actually a mechanic. And of course, he's busy. He's doing, doing stuff. And uh, I drive in and I'm, I'm impatient and I'm angry and I'm like, dad, the, the stupid windshield wipers don't work and they need to be fixed, la, 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 whatever. And I'm like, I, I need your vehicle. And I was just being really short with him. And <laughs> you got to know with my dad, that's, that's not cool. And so he got really short with me, and it was kind of a battle of the wills. And, and finally, I was like, can I just have your keys to your truck? And he throws them at me, and I, I grab them, you know, and I'm like, whatever. You know, and I, I, I was just, it was a bad day. And so, so I went, uh, went, got into his truck, and uh, again, I was, just, I was amped up. I was impatient. I had stuff to do. And I didn't realize that my dad, he had, he had parked next to a dumpster, a, a big metal dumpster, but he had kind of angle parked in. That's kind of how he, how he always did it. And I, I thought it was just straight in and out. And so I just get in. I start that thing up, throw it in reverse, and, and I, I smashed the passenger side door right into it. And in fact, I got wedged. I couldn't even move. I got wedged. It's amazing how just in a nanosecond how you're how your heart can change, right? <laughs> I was so angry one second, so impatient, and then I, I put it into park, and I, and I walked in very sheepishly. I kind of tail between my legs, right? I'm like, Dad, I, I'm really sorry. I dented up your truck. I hit the, you know, and my, da <laughs> my dad's like, whatever. I'm like, no, Dad, it's wedged. I can't even get it out. He's like, well, back it out anyways, right? I'm like, okay. <laughs> so I get in there, and, and I throw it in reverse, and and just totally made a massive dent. Finally got out of there and, uh, and drove away. Not very patient. And uh, my impatience made me pay that day. They say that patience is a virtue. Possess it if you can. Found seldom in a woman, less in a man. And I am certainly proof of that. You know, the inability to wait has gotten me, it's probably gotten you into a lot of trouble at times. You know, most of the debt that we accrue is because we're impatient, because we want something and we want it now, even if we can't afford it. Uh, many of the relational problems that we get into is because we're rushing a relationship and we're just like, I just want to get into this relationship right now. And then later on, it's like, who is this person? It's like, well, you didn't get, you know, you didn't take any time to, to really get to know them. A lot of our issues are because of impatience, because we're not able to wait. I want to ask you this morning, do you find it hard to wait? Do you find it hard to wait? Is there something that you're waiting for in your life right now? Perhaps you're looking for a, a new job or a new position in your company, or perhaps you're just looking for that contract to come through that you've bid on. M maybe you're looking for the person of your dreams and you've been waiting. Maybe you're looking for that acceptance letter to university or to college. Perhaps you're looking for a pain-free body. You've been waiting for a long time, racked with pain. Maybe you're just looking for family unity, but you've been waiting. You know, I think fast food and technological advances, they've actually ramped up our impatience. Wouldn't you agree? That, that maybe we weren't all that patient before, but now we are even less patient. In fact, I was at Starbucks about two weeks ago, and I overheard them do some training, and they all know me there, and I'm, I'm kind of just listening in on, you know, their training, because I'm thinking, you know, if I don't preach good today, maybe I'll be there as well, being a barista, so I better check in. And, and they, were, they were doing the drive-through training, and the, the one woman said, said, listen, if you don't get the drink out in about four minutes, we usually just give it to them for free. And I was just like, note to self. <laughs> Order the most complicated drink in the whole wide world and pray that it takes more than four minutes. <laughs> we are impatient. You know, 20 years ago, this was the sound of the future. <laughs>
For those, yeah, for those of you who don't know, that's how we used to connect to the internet. That, that was the sound of the future. Now, it's a sound that makes me sick to my stomach because I know how slow it was. You'd get on the internet and you'd go to a web page and the pictures would come in line by line. I mean, now I would just rather not have a computer at all. If it was that slow, I mean, you can throw data faster than, than what happened then. But I remember when I was in my second year of college, and I went on the internet for the first time with some friends of mine. And those, this one friend said, man, I was just on a Christian chat and I was talking with someone in Hawaii. He's like, come on, you got to see this. And so we wait and it takes us like 15 minutes just to get on the internet. And then all of a sudden we, we start chatting with this person. And I'm just like, they're in Hawaii and we are here in PC and we are talking to one another via the internet. I was just blown away. I mean, now I'm just like, yeah, of course we were. <laughs> Hello. And it was so slow. I mean, it, would take for, it probably took two minutes just to even see the typing that, that went on. But it was so advanced. It was so advanced. You know, wait might be one of the most fearful words that you can say to a child. I mean, saying yes is awesome. Saying no is very scary. But I'm telling you, if you say wait to a kid, it's catastrophic. If I say wait to my kids... There's just a lineup of questions like, but how long, Dad? How long do we have to wait? Last night, they went over to their friends just next door, and they were supposed to go at 6.30. Well, Dad, what time are we going at? And, and when are we going to go? And is the time almost at? Finally, I said, there's going to be no movie night next door if you don't be quiet. I will tell you when. Until then, you will wait. It's catastrophic to say wait to a child. Have you ever sat for a prolonged period in a waiting room? You know, even the word waiting room or the words waiting room, they just kind of conjure up all sorts of fear. I mean, let's be honest, a waiting room isn't a great place. I just want to poke my eyeballs out every time I'm in a waiting room, right? I mean, think about how drab it is and how mundane it is and, and how uncomfy the chairs are. And then you get to read magazines that are absolutely full of death and disease and sickness. I mean, waiting rooms, let's be honest, they're not the greatest things that have ever happened. And no one talks to one another. I mean, if you're talking in the waiting room, you're kind of weird. It's usually just that real sterile silence, right? It makes us uncomfortable and unsettled and unsure. It's not a good place to be. No one wants to be in a waiting room. No one wants to be in a holding pattern. If you've ever flown and all of a sudden you wonder, why are we flying in circles? You're in this holding pattern. None of us like that. We want to land. We want to get into our appointment. We want to get on with things. So I want to ask you this morning, what do we do when we find ourselves in God's waiting room? What do we do when we find ourselves in God's waiting room? That God has given us a promise, but we have not seen the fulfillment of that promise. That God has given us a promise, but we are not seeing the payoff. What do we do in the middle? What do we do when we're in God's waiting room? Because I, let me assure you, you will be in God's waiting room at some point or another. What I want you to do and what I want you to think about is I want you to remember just a few principles Remember a few things when you're in God's waiting room. First of all, remember there is always a process between the promise and the payoff. There's always a process between the promise and the payoff. A few weeks ago, I spoke about planting and harvesting. And there's always a delay between planting and harvesting. That's natural. There's always a delay. It's, it's not instantaneous. It's not like my kids saying, Dad, I'm hungry. And they think it's just going to pop out of nowhere. It's like, it's going to take some time. Dad, why is the, why is the food not ready? Because I'm boiling the water. <laughs> Go to your room. <laughs> it's going to take some time between planting and harvesting. There's going to be a, a process between the promise and the payoff. And in the meantime, don't lose your mind. Don't lose your mind. You see, many of you, you have, you have planted your time. You have planted your finances. You have planted your effort, and you're looking for that payoff, and it's not coming. And I want to say to you, don't lose your mind. Don't forget God's promises. 
And don't forget his presence. He will get you through. He will never leave you high and dry. He will never leave you forsaken. He's going to come through. Don't lose your mind. You see, it's very tempting in the dark, in that process, in that waiting room, it's very tempting in the dark to forget what God has fully revealed to us in the light. You see, some of us, we have been revealed things as we are reading through God's word, or, or some of us have, have received promises from God, but when they're not being fulfilled, it's very tempting for us to forget all about God's goodness. Don't lose your mind. Don't lose your mind. There is a process between the promise and the payoff. Second thing to remember, there is always more to the issue than meets the eye. You know, while we are waiting for the fulfillment of the promise, the devil is busy sowing seeds of doubt into our lives. That's his job. That's his job. He wants to sow seeds of doubt into your life. In fact, in John chapter 10, verse 10, it says the devil comes to steal, kill, and destroy. That's what he's all about. He wants to, he wants to destroy your life. He wants to kill you. He wants to kill those promises that God has planted deep within inside of you. So when you're in the waiting room of life, it's no wonder that he is working overtime. He doesn't like you. He doesn't love you. He doesn't want good things for you. He wants to steal from you. He wants to sow that doubt within you. Don't let him. You don't have to let him. You don't have to let him. You just have to remember there is more than meets the eye. You see, what we have to do is we have to actually open our eyes up to the reality of the situation. The Apostle Paul says in Ephesians chapter 6, verse 12, he says, For a struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the powers of this dark world, and against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly realms. What the Apostle Paul is saying, listen, there's more going on than you think. You think that you're in a battle that's just between you and your, and your friends or you and your spouse? No, 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 no. It's something way bigger. I don't know if any of you have watched War Room. It's a wonderful movie. And what it does is it gives us an indication how there is more than meets the eye, how there is a spiritual battle waging. And we have to engage that spiritual battle. And one of the ways we do that most powerfully and most effectively is through prayer. That, that when there is more than meets the eye going on, we need to pray. That that is a weapon that God has given us. In Daniel chapter 10, verses 12 and 13, it's not on the monitors and it's not in your notes, but there's an interesting passage of scripture that kind of gives us an idea of what's going on behind the scenes. An angel comes to Daniel and he says, don't be afraid, Daniel. Since the first day that you set your mind to gain understanding and to humble yourself before your God, your words were heard. You see, the angel says to Daniel, as soon as you prayed, your words were heard. I want to say to you today that if you've been praying about something, God has heard you. God has heard you. He heard you that moment that you prayed. And then he goes on, and I have come in response to them. But the prince of the Persian kingdom, that is the enemy, the devil, resisted me 21 days. Then Michael, one of the chief princes, came to help me because I was detained there with the king of Persia. Basically what this angel says is there's a spiritual warfare that's going on. Satan didn't want this prayer to be answered. And, and so we had to come in and an angel, uh, Michael, he, he came in and he kicked some butt. See, we don't see those things, do we? We just put in a prayer, and for some of us, it's, it's almost like we, we put some coins into a vending machine. And it's like we've pressed the button, and it's like, come on, where's my Snickers bar? And, and what we have to realize is that there's more going on than we think. There's a battle being waged. There's a battle being waged. Remember that. There's more than meets the eye. Thirdly, remember, waiting is a test of our character. Waiting is a test of our character. Now, none of us like to hear that, do we? I mean, even just hearing that, many of you, you're just kind of rolling your eyes. Is my character not developed yet? I feel like I've been waiting forever. And I want to tell you that many answers to our prayers cannot come until we're ready to receive them. Many times we are not ready for the answer that God is going to give us. He wants to do wonderful things in our lives. He wants to fulfill those promises. He wants to bring that payoff. But many of us, we're just not ready for it. We're not ready for what, what God might bring us into. You know, many of us, we're very competent. Th that we have competency, we have all sorts of gifts and abilities and talents, and we can do all sorts of things. But what God wants to do is he wants to work on our character. Because sometimes our character and our competency are not in line with one another. And I believe in the waiting room of life, that's where God wants to work on our character. And he wants to bring our character and our competency 
in line and in sync. Many of the greatest leaders from the Bible and then throughout history, many of the greatest leaders have had to wait, have had to wait till they came into a place of prominence because God wanted to do a work in their lives. They had to wait around. They had to play second fiddle. They had to do the servant jobs because God wanted to do something in their life. God wanted to refine them. In 1 Peter chapter 1, verses 6 and 7, it says this, In all this you greatly rejoice, though now for a little while you may have had to suffer grief in all kinds of trials. These have come so that the proven genuineness of your faith of greater worth than gold, which perishes even though refined by fire, may result in praise, glory, and honor when Jesus Christ is revealed. Basically, Peter's saying, listen, God wants to refine you. He wants to refine you through the hard times if you will let him. An analogy that comes to my mind, and one that I've thought about a lot, is that of sandpaper. That often God wants to fill in the cracks in my life. He wants to fill in the dents. Last year, we bought a little trailer, a bowler, a 1975 bowler. Melissa just had to have it, okay? So we get this trailer. It was, it was in a farmer's field. It was in poor shape, and, and we had to work on it. So, so guess who gets to fill in all the holes, right? She did the interior. I did the exterior. And uh, there I am putting Bondo on it because they're all fiberglass. But, you know, when, when, you first, when you first start sanding down, you need a pretty heavy grit. You know, it's kind of like a 40 or a 60 grit. You're, you're just, you're trying to take off the edges. And then as you smooth it out, then, then you, you use maybe 200 grit. And then maybe you even finish off with a 2,000, and it's almost like glass. And in the same way, in the waiting period, that God wants to refine us. And sometimes he has to use really heavy grit sandpaper. And sometimes he has to use really fine sandpaper. But what he's trying to do is make a masterpiece. What he's trying to do is actually refine you for his purposes, for his glory. You know, there are many seven-year-olds that actually know how to drive. When I was seven years old, I knew how to drive, all right? I would drive that little Chevy Acadian on the three acres of land that my dad had for his shop. But I want to tell you right now, it wouldn't have been in anyone's best interest if they gave me a driver's license and let me drive on a road, right? Because although I may have had the ability to drive, I didn't have the wisdom and that's why we wait until kids are, are 16. <laughs> that's another sermon. <laughs> you have to wait. Why do I have to wait? Why do I have to wait? Why do I have to wait? Wait. You will see. You will see. It will all make sense. So what do we do while we wait? Well, the first thing I want to tell you, what, what we do while we wait is we learn. We learn. The waiting room is really God's university. The tuition is free, but the cost is very expensive. God's university, the tuition is free, but the cost is very expensive. It's steep because it, it takes time, and sometimes it's very hard. What I've learned to do in order to actually learn the things that God is teaching me is I've learned to journal. When, when you diary, you basically said, well, this morning I woke up, and I did this, and I ate this, and I went there. That, that's a good diary. A journal says, this is what I'm learning. This is what God is teaching me. This is what God is speaking to me through his word. And I've learned to journal because if I don't journal, I forget. Do you know how easy we forget things? That God will speak something into our life and then we have one little setback and we totally forget that. That's why we need to write it down so we can come back to it. Even this week, I came back to some things in my journals so that I could be reminded of what God has called me to. I could be reminded of his promises and reminded of what he wants to fulfill in my life, but also to be reminded that I'm in a process and God wants to teach me. He wants me to learn. So don't just twiddle your thumbs in the waiting room. Learn, learn. When it comes to remembering, a fourth thing that we need to remember is we need to remember that we're not alone in the wait. Isn't it true that misery loves company? It does. I mean, when you go into a waiting room and there's a lot of other people in the waiting room, I mean, there's a couple reactions. One is like, oh my, I'll never get in. But, but another one is, is, well, at least I'm not the only one. At least I'm not the only one that's going through this. And I want to tell you, throughout the ages, millions of people have gone through God's waiting room. If you think you're the only one in process, if you think you've been the only one that has had promises of God that have been unfulfilled so far, I want to tell you, get in line. Get in line. The people that God has used for his glory the most have had to go through the waiting period. You know, in, in Hebrews chapter 6.15, it says, And so after waiting patiently 
Abraham received what was promised. If you know the Abraham story, you realize that Abraham waited a long time. He was going to be the father of many nations, and yet he waited so long to be a dad himself. There must have been many times where he thought, I don't know, I guess it's not going to happen. And yet God came through. God came through. So what do you have to do today if you're in God's waiting room? I've already talked about how you need to learn. But the second thing you need to do is you need to act. You need to act. Act like the promise is already fulfilled. See, this isn't a time for us just to loaf around in our PJs when we're in the waiting room. This isn't a time just to chomp on Oreos and and get on our Instagram or Pinterest or Facebook. It's not a time for that. It's a time, actually, to act and to do things. It's an opportunity to live like you've already had the promise fulfilled. You know, what we need to do is we need to turn that whole idea, you know, I would like to do this at some point. We need to turn that around and and just say, I did it. I did it. Rather than just say, oh, I wish I could do this. We just, you just need to do it. I mean, really, waiting is not just chilling. Waiting is not just hanging out. It's getting ready. It's getting ready. When you're in God's waiting room, you want to get ready. For example, if you're here today and you've always wanted a degree, but, but you can't right now because you've got young children and maybe you're a single mom, I want to encourage you, go get a library card and the thing that you want to study, just read those books late at night, early in the morning, maybe have them in an audio book. Act as if you've already received the promise because at some point you're going to have to make time for that schooling. So make time now. Perhaps you're looking for a job. Don't just loaf around. Wake up at 6 a.m., get appropriately dressed, and get out there because when you do, you're training your body for that time when it will happen. And God will say, I can trust this person. They're not just wasting time. They're getting ready for the promise. They're getting ready for the promise. Another thing you can do is you can imitate. George Bernard Shaw said, imitation is not just the sincerest form of flattery. It's the sincerest form of learning. You know, I've learned from so many people that, that have gone before me. I've learned so many leadership lessons, and you can too. In Hebrews chapter 6, verse 12, it says, we do not want you to become lazy, but to imitate those who through faith and patience inherit what has been promised. The writer of Hebrews says, imitate those who have already come through this. And then serve. Serve. Just do something. You know, when we're in God's waiting room, a lot of times we can become navel gazers. We become so, so focused on self. We become so focused on on what isn't happening in our lives. And we need, to, we need to look out. We need to serve other people. You need to use your giftings even when you're in the waiting period. Because God doesn't want to set you on a shelf. He wants you to be used, but he's got to teach you some things in that waiting period. And one of the best ways to do that is just to serve other people. You know, the cure for that, for that whole selfishness, that cure for the navel-gazing, is really to look to the needs of others. And finally, what do we do when we're in the waiting room? We pray. We pray. You know, for some of us, we just think of prayer as as something that's almost like a waste of time. Many of you, prayer is the first thing to go if you can't quite fit it into your schedule. I want to encourage you. I want to implore you that prayer would be the first thing you do when you wake up in the morning. Prayer would be the last thing you do before you go to bed. Prayer would be something that you do throughout the day because prayer changes things. Because as I've already said, there is more than meets the eye. We live in a spiritual world and prayer works. In fact, it says in Isaiah 40, 31, those who wait on the Lord will renew their strength. They shall mount up on wings like eagles. They shall walk and not, run and not be weary. They shall walk and not faint. You know, when you're stuck in the waiting room, you can worry or you can wait on the Lord. You can worry or you can wait on the Lord. One rots you from the inside out and one renews you. If you will wait on the Lord, you will be renewed. You will be renewed. And let me add one more thing that you can remember when you're in God's waiting room. Remember that God always keeps his promises. You know, in the 40 years that I've been alive, I've realized that God always keeps his promises. Always, always, always. He's always faithful to his word. Always faithful to his word. 
in Habakkuk chapter 2, verse 3. It says this, this vision is for a future time. It describes the end and it will be fulfilled. The promises that God made will be fulfilled. If it seems slow in coming, wait patiently for it will surely take place. It will not be delayed. You know, I want to tell you today, God's timing is perfect. Not a minute too soon, not a moment too late. You know, I'm reminded of Jesus when he's told that Lazarus is dying. And Lazarus was someone that Jesus loved, and and he's told that Lazarus is dying. Jesus, please come quickly. And Jesus had only five miles to travel. Even on foot, you should have been able to get there in a couple hours. And it takes Jesus three days. And by the time Jesus gets there, Lazarus is not only dead, but he's in the grave, and he's already starting to stink it up. And they say, Jesus, you're late. And I can only imagine Jesus, he just gets a smile and he thinks, Oh, if you only knew. My timing is perfect. I've just been setting up a miracle. And he says, Lazarus, come forth. Oh man, if you've been waiting for a long time, I want to tell you today, maybe Jesus is just setting you up for a miracle. He's not a minute too soon and not a moment too late. You know what? The greatest promise in all of the Bible is contained in John chapter 3, verse 16. For God so loved the world that he gave his only son, that whoever believes in him will not perish, but have everlasting life. And that is a promise that will come true right now. That today, if you will believe that Jesus died for our sins and rose again on the third day, if you will believe and trust in him right now, He will give you the assurance of salvation. He will give you the assurance that even though our bodies may waste away, we will live eternally with him. We will have everlasting life. And I want to invite you today to put your hope and trust in Jesus to have that everlasting life. Would you bow your heads with me right now? And if that's your prayer, if that's what you want to do, that you would just pray along with me. Dear Jesus, I want to thank you so much that when we're in your waiting room, that you want to teach us, you want us to learn, you want us to become more like you, that you're actually just getting us ready for the fulfillment of the promise. Lord, for those that are here today and they have never invited you in, they have never said, Lord, I trust in you. Jesus, I believe in you right now. I just pray they would open their hearts to you and say, Jesus, I believe in you. I believe that you came to this earth and you lived a sinless life. You died and you rose again on the third day so that I might have life. And Lord, I thank you that if we just believe in you, you say that we will have everlasting life. Though our bodies may waste away, we will know you forever in eternity. Thank you that that fulfillment is coming even right now. We thank you, Jesus. We pray these things in your name. Amen. If you prayed that prayer for the first time, if you just just stay with me, if you prayed that prayer for the first time, would you take one of those welcome cards and just check off that I invited Jesus into my life and fill that out and then just hand it in to the information desk. We would love to have a record of that and be able to follow up with you. And for those of you who find yourself in the waiting room of God, between the promise and the payoff, if you're going through a process right now, I want to tell you that God is not finished with you yet. He is still at work in your life, so learn and become more like him, because the day is coming. The day is coming when God is going to fulfill those promises. May the Lord bless you this week in all you do.